Okay, good afternoon everybody. Should we get started? I think so. Everybody, more people will probably trickle in from post break, but uh, given that really the only reason I'm here is to keep everybody on time, I should probably stick to my, uh, to my one job. Uh, so welcome, welcome to, uh, to this session on challenges and solutions for tackling cyber-enabled illegal wildlife trade. Uh, thanks for coming back in the afternoon. Uh, thanks for sitting in the Huxley Theater uh, in a fairly hot uh, environment. I've done many events in this, uh, in this theater, and they've been on wildly different topics, but they've all shared one common theme, which is that by the end of the day, it's extremely warm in here. So, um, so please don't uh, nod off on us, but we, we appreciate the, the temperature. Um, so my name's Lucas Joppa. Um, I'll be the moderator for this session. And um, really, I'm only here for two reasons, I think. Uh, the first is that I work at Microsoft. I'm the chief environmental officer for the company. And that means that all day, every day, I basically look after our cross-company efforts in minimizing our negative environmental impacts while trying to maximize our positive environmental impacts. And so when we think about the topic that we're discussing today, illegal wildlife trade, and particularly illegal wildlife trade online, we really kind of look at that from both a bottom-up and a top-down approach. From the bottom-up, we look to support organizations that are using software. You've heard from many of them um, already today that are using software and machine learning approaches to tackle the on-the-ground poaching and illegal taking of wildlife from natural habitats. And then on our online platforms, platforms like Bing, we work really hard to do everything in our power to minimize the ability for people to actually engage in illegal online trade. And that's why actually one of the first things that um, we did when we started seriously considering this space was joined a, a coalition put together by World Wildlife Fund and uh, Traffic and IFA called the Global Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking Online, which we don't talk a ton about, but it's a platform for most of the major technology companies in the world to come together, as we have been over the past several years, to discuss and share best practices and to hear from academics working on this space so that we can better learn how to minimize um, the problem of illegal trafficking uh, on our platforms and try to get better over and over and over. So that's actually probably the real reason selfishly that I'm here uh, because I'm excited to learn uh, from the panelists that we've put together. Um, very pragmatically, probably, uh, I've known Dave uh, for many, many years, and if there's one thing that he's learned about me, it's that I love to talk, but I also love to shut other people down when they're talking. So as a panelist, uh, he's given me that job as moderator. He's made it extremely simple for me. So I have these two friendly cards, five minutes and one minute. Each of our panelists will be speaking for five minutes. We'll work to ensure that we stick to that time period because really what we want to be able to do is engage in a, a theater-wide conversation about the work that the panelists are going to be speaking on. So with no further ado, we're going to be going straight down the, uh, the panel row here. We'll be starting with Dr. David Roberts and uh, move on from there. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Lucas. Um, Um, so, uh, my name's Dave Roberts, I'm at the University of Kent in the Dural Institute of Conservation and Ecology and I've been interested in wildlife trade, particularly over the internet for the last eight to nine years. Um, and so what I'm just going to do is give you uh, a short overview of what is kind of the trends that are occurring. Uh, so, uh, as you'll probably uh, realise, uh, the internet is, is fantastic, it allows us to um, communicate, it allows us to trade, and so you get billions of transactions going on daily, but within those billions of transactions, you've got millions of illegal transactions occurring, and this can be in a wide uh, variety of different trades. Uh, can we get it going back? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> right. um, uh, and so, yeah, as I say, it allows illegal transactions to, to occur, um, which makes it um, very difficult to disrupt because it's this uh, large mass of, um, uh, of transactions. So differentiation is uh, difficult. 
What, uh, what you do find and what does allow us to uh, have a level of disruption is um, for any trade to take place, whether or not it's illegal, um, illegal wildlife trade or any other trade, is that within the people trading, there has to be some level of convention there, whether or not it's linguistic convention or code words or uh, characters or so on. Uh, there has to be some sort of network to allow trade to occur. And also, there has to be a level of technical knowledge whether or not it's using, uh, say, eBay to trade, or whether or not it's closed forums on Facebook, or whether or not it's using WeChat or so on. Um, of course, you can have a fantastic secure system, but your system can only be as good as the most stupid person in your network. There's no point having a fantastic system and nobody can actually trade with you. And then finally, um, as is mentioned actually in the early session, transport, that's another important area. You have to be able to move that item once you've sold it. So where is it taking place? Generally, there's three main areas. You've got surface web, where trade is still occurring. Um, you, you're finding things like still finding ivory for sale in these networks, um, plants such as the orchid on the, on the front cover, um, traditional medicines, a variety of different items are for sale, pets and so on. Then you move into what we call the deep web. And so the, the deep web are... Um, uh, sites that are, are not indexed by likes of Google and so on, um, and these are such as the closed groups in, uh, in Facebook. And here, you're beginning to get either niche trades, uh, such as, you know, orchid groups or so on that are trading within their groups, or you're getting the trades that are, um, are highly charismatic in terms of being illegal, and therefore they've created these um, closed groups. After that, you've got the, uh, the dark net, so these kind of crypto markets, such as the former uh, Alphabay. Uh, very little is actually happening on those, those markets from what we can see. Uh, generally, it's cacti to make mescaline or fake, uh, or, fake or counterfeit handbags with uh, leathers in it. But with all, all these, linguistics is, a, is an important uh, characteristic to allow trade to occur. We often hear about ivory and code words in ivory. This isn't, the, um, this isn't necessarily the norm. You get slangs and vernaculars that are created not necessarily to uh, conceal the trade, but are just created within the communities. And then, of course, things like Latin names in uh, plant trade. Uh, so in terms of solutions, I've kind of divided into these three, three areas that can contain solutions, but um, some challenges as well. There isn't going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. The trades are extremely diverse in species, in products, in geographical locations, and the sites on which they take place. Um, but the first point is you've got to be able to identify, even if you're going to create AI uh, solutions, you've got to actually identify what is uh, illegal and what is the species of interest. And that decision has to be recorded to create your trading data set. Um, and therefore, one of the things we've developed is this kind of one-click toolbar to help um, identify those, uh, those characters. Then after that, you can start going into um, AI-based solutions. Um, image analysis is a very popular uh, area and, and int increasingly interesting. However, you can get a, a long way just using uh, text characters and other metadata that's surrounded there. So we got 93% accuracy for identifying ivory on eBay just based on feedback score, uh, postage price, because ivory is quite heavy, and also um, number of bids. Those three characteristics, we've got 93% accuracy for ivory. After that... Um, you've got other groups such as orchids, cacti, reptiles. These are often traded either using uh, slang words within the communities, but often using Latin names. And there's a long way we can go in terms of tackling those kind of uh, trades that are often forgotten um, by just looking, at the, looking up Latin names. And then after that, it's moving into, though you've identified it, what do you do next? And so we need to start thinking about how we investigate online trade in terms of investigating who is actually behind it, not just identifying, identifying it and identifying the species and the le uh, illegality. There's a variety of ways things can be illegal. Um, but actually, once you find that, uh, that item, going into investigations. And although uh, APIs... Um, are a very useful way in terms of um, 
uh, getting data and handling the, the data, they do still create challenges in terms of uh, copyright and, and so on, in terms of holding that data. Um, and I will now pass on to um, Joss, who will uh, hopefully talk about ethics and... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, so my name is Joss Wright. I'm a senior research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute. I'm also co-director of the Oxford Martin program on the illegal wildlife trade, where I'm focusing on studying the, the moves online um, of the wildlife trade. Um, and, and there's sort of endless things I, I could say about, about sort of how we investigate it and the things that we're finding there. But I thought it would be interesting to focus on the ethics of studying um, the wildlife trade online um, because it brings up a number of issues that, that, that change from the traditional ethics that you see in offline research and raises some new issues that aren't commonly um, discussed. So, you know, just as a, as, a, as a reminder to the ethics class that you may have sat in at some point, um, there are a number of core ethical principles to conducting research. Um, a lot of the modern ethical principles come from the Belmont report from 1979, which was a bioethics um, uh, research report. But, and there are different ways of framing these, but the, the key um, ethical principles you will often see in research ethics ethics are, are first off beneficence, the idea that when you are studying a set of research participants, then you should do no harm to those, to those uh, participants. So to remember that even though we may well be studying people who are, who are engaging in, in illegal wildlife trading and doing horrible things to animals, we still have some duty of care towards the individuals involved in our study. Uh, and I'll expand on that later on. Um, another thing is informed consent. Do people consent to be part of this research? Um, they, do they have ways to get out of the research? Do we, have, we must avoid deceiving people. You, it's, it's, um, you know, none of these are, are completely hard and strict rules, but as a general principle, it's, um, it, it's best to, to engage with people and say, this is what I'm studying, I am a researcher, I'm doing these things, this is what I want to study. Another one which is probably very um, appropriate um, for the online uh, research ethics is that are the problems of anonymity and confidentiality. Um, people are sharing information online, they're discussing things online, we can retrieve information about people, we're all aware of the data breaches and the privacy concerns that exist uh, with, with online platforms nowadays, and breaches of anonymity and breaches of that confidentiality with people that have shared information online is a particularly serious um, aspect of studying things online. Another one that goes sort of somewhat back to informed consent is that people participate voluntarily um, in, in research. Now that can be less appropriate if you're studying a forum or a mailing list or a closed group on Facebook or something like that. Um, but to some extent we need to wrestle with the idea that we may not be in a position to go to every member of a 50,000 member Facebook group and say, do you agree to take part in my, in my online research? Um, and then the final one that, that you know, sort of falls on a slightly different track is our research should be independent of any sort of vested interests. Whilst we may, as came up in the last panel, be uh, straying into the realm of activism uh, in doing our academic research, we have to remember that it's supposed to be, as far as possible, objective um, academic research that we're doing. So to, to focus then specifically on things that affect uh, the, the online component of this work, um, the internet brings with it not only privacy concerns, but also a significant problem of attribution. When you go to an online forum, when you see uh, posts on a mailing list, when you see posts on a discussion forum, um, it may well and usually will be occurring under a pseudonym. People will not be working via their real name. And while we have many ways to de-anonymize people online, um, the problem of attribution is extremely hard. Can you be absolutely sure that the individual discussing a particular feature or a particular product actually is the offline identity you may be trying to link them to? Um, and it's not just a problem of getting it wrong. There can be collateral harms when this happens. There can be real-world collateral harms. Um, somebody may be arrested or picked up for, for, for doing something that they didn't do. But there can be collateral harms to, say, a family if, um, if an internet connection is taken down or if a, a financial penalty is, is applied. So this is something that, that affects a lot of people. Um, one of the key concerns that the internet raises is a jurisdictional one, um, whereby it increases the capacity for people to communicate between countries, between continents, um, and we have to consider in which particular jurisdiction may, may an event have taken place. If somebody was communicating from the US to 
to, to Germany about a particular product, where has the harm taken place? Where can we get in touch with law enforcement or other things like that? Um, a slightly more subtle issue, which I, I, I really would enjoy talking about for much longer than I have to talk about it, is from a lot of the traditional research, there's been a lot of work in individual person-to-person -person contextual information. You go and talk to people, you go and interview people, you go and look at a local context. As we move online and we're starting to deal with larger and larger volumes of data, we move into a far more quantitative form of research. We, we start to do machine learning approaches to identify statistical patterns and trends and things. And it's very important not to lose the contextual qualitative information that comes from actually talking to people. Um, I'm a bit of a pariah in the computer science community for saying we should talk to people. Um, it, it's not popular. Um, but. They, this can cause problems, you know, we've got to remember that whilst we may develop machine learning algorithms that are 93% accurate, that still means that they're 7% inaccurate, and that 7% can be very, very large. Um, not to put down the development of such <laughs> amazing techniques. Okay. Um, but, uh, and, and a final thing, and something in, actually that came out of the, uh, the Global Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking, such a catchy name, um, is uh, when we start to crack down on the surface web platforms, the open platforms. We move people into more and more secure systems. We move into dark web forums, deep web forums, end-to-end -end encrypted um, uh, platforms. So we have to be careful that we don't, um, we don't sort of create this hard core of people who are able to do things with complete impunity. So uh, to, to delve a little bit more deeply into the, the privacy and access concerns, um, people who are acting online have particular rights, particularly if we're in the European context with the, the General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, when we carry out research and we gather data on individuals, we have a responsibility to perform data anonymization to remove identifiers from individuals. That's something that is much harder than you may think it is to do. You can't just remove names. There can be very, very uh, subtle ways to re-identify people from their data. We need to minimize the data that we gather so that we only gather data that we need for the research we're performing. Um, and we need to be careful about how we publish data sets when, um, when they are published in our research. Um, I've already mentioned deception and covert research. Um, there are some good lessons to be learned here from the field of criminology who have had to deal with this for a long time. You can do covert research where you, where you deceive people and you take part in something, but it should be considered a last resort. And particularly online, this involves going into closed groups, into closed forums in representing who you are. Um, and again, with all of these, there are problems of informed consent. If you are scraping a web page that goes back 10 years, how do you get consent from everyone who ever posted to that web page that they consent to be part of your research? Uh, <clears throat> and what this leads into is this, this scraping problem where we may want to go and gather huge amounts of data from Facebook, from eBay, from, from a, a proprietary forum. Um, but in many cases, people can consider these platforms as private spaces. They may say things there that they don't expect to be public, and there can be a significant um, uh, betrayal of their, of their trust when you scrape that data. Um, and this goes for, for both public platforms and, and the dark web. Um, okay. Uh, and then to sort of turn it back on ourselves, I think one thing that we shouldn't overlook, and people are probably very well aware of this, is uh, the, the harms to the researcher or the institution from doing particular kinds of research. It's not all just about the people that we're researching or the, the, the phenomena that we're researching. Um, when we expose a particular feature, when we publish data that we, we've gathered and when we've researched something, um, there can be backlash and abuse from communities. I've studied uh, dark web forums for drug marketplaces and seen this in my colleagues. I've seen people who study memes online and, and, and racist material uh, online. And there can be significant backlash on a researcher, and that has to be considered. Um, we also have to be careful that our results aren't misrepresented. This isn't specific to the online case, but the moment you say dark web, you're going to get some, some media interest. And representing what that means and what goes on there is, uh, is something we need to be careful about. Um, when interacting with platforms, there are terms of service that we often agree to. We don't necessarily have to abide by them. 
he says with Microsoft sitting next to him. <laughs> um, um, but the, there, there's a, there is an ethical consideration to be made there. Uh, the service provider platform or service can impose terms on us that we, we want to abide by as far as is possible, but we also want to consider what is, um, what is allowable legally. Um, in many cases, there are sort of automated licenses we agree to just by going to a website. You can often scrape websites. You can often use the API um, to get sort of certain volumes of scraping. But we have to be careful. We have to be respectful of accessing these services so that we don't harm them. We don't um, unwittingly gain too much data. Or, um, and that leads us to, you know, we've got to be careful not to overly abuse the intended functionality. Um, we can use platforms to do research. We can, we can sort of tweak their systems in interesting ways, but we shouldn't break the systems entirely to, to achieve our goals. <laughs> um, so just to finish off then, um, some questions I'd, I'd leave open here is, is data that is unintentionally public, is that something we can use happily? Um, there's a legal doctrine in the US called the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine that, that prevents this in certain cases, in legal cases, and we need to consider that in our, in our research ethics. Um, to what extent is web scraping and automated data collection acceptable, uh, and where are the limits of how we do that? How much can we subvert the intended purposes of platforms and services to find out the things that we want to know about what people are doing there? Um, and should we, and to what extent should we be concerned about driving the harms of the online wildlife trade to more and more secure platforms where we lose the ability to study them? So, that's me done. Thank you. So, I'm Anita Lavornia, a lecturer in criminology uh, from the University of uh, Southampton. So the, my premise here is that uh, my area of expertise is not specifically on uh, wildlife trafficking and on plant trafficking, but my area of expertise is on serious and organized crime and uh, online trafficking activities in general. I incidentally, almost a few years ago, bumped into research on wildlife uh, trafficking while I was comparing other types of trafficking activities uh, online. Um, my uh, puzzle at the beginning was that, uh, again, coming from, uh, from criminology, I was reading a lot of reports or a lot of research mentioning the fact that uh, cyberspace was used as a facilitator for, for trafficking activities, but uh, uh, I wanted to know a little bit more, so how, to what extent it is used, and how this, is, this use is changing uh, the social organization of criminal groups and criminal activities, so basically how the activity is carried out uh, and uh, the composition and the network relationship of criminal, of criminal groups. So I will very, 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 very briefly say what I've done um, uh, now, well, three years, uh, um, four years ago almost, uh, on criminal opportunities and wildlife trafficking, and uh, very briefly uh, how I'm expanding uh, this, uh, uh, this research uh, uh, currently with, uh, with an ongoing project. So again, uh, I wanted to know more about the criminal opportunities that internet was giving for wildlife trafficking. So what I've done, again, it's a, this is a script. Uh, I use script analysis, which is, uh, a, let's say, social science, if you want, a research tool that has been used uh, quite a lot in criminology to study um, trafficking activities in general, again, specifically wildlife uh, um, trafficking. So basically, the idea is to break down the criminal activity into very small little pieces to pinpoint precisely where, to what extent, and for what purpose the criminal activity, so in this case, uh, the criminogenic uh, aspect uh, and the features of, uh, of cyberspace uh, were exploited uh, uh, by criminals, uh, by what criminals, what type of criminals, and to what extent. So the idea is that once you have identified this uh, very uh, small, tiny, if you want, criminal opportunities at the very like, detailed level, you can better address uh, uh, the most efficient uh, measures for, uh, for intervention, especially for a law enforcement purpose in this, uh, in this case. So uh, I don't have like, time to go much into detail into this research, but just to give you an idea, uh, Previous reports generally were discussing about uh, opportunities online for, uh, for uh, um, wildlife trafficking. But actually, if you look closely at these opportunities, we can see that we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, subtypes of opportunities, if you want, like communicative inform inform opportunities, informational, relations, relational, technical, organizational, managerial, persuasive, and promotional. And uh, for every one of these different opportunities, it comes uh, with uh, specific features uh, and with uh, potentials uh, for law enforcement for uh, 
um, disruption. Uh, something that I need to um, stress here, because I think it's in line with what was uh, stressed just uh, uh, before my presentation, is the type of analysis that I carried out uh, um, in this, uh, uh, for this study. So this is, was uh, a very um, qualitative, in-depth analysis on a very limited number of case studies. It was just 25 cases for, uh, um, from four countries where I was able to have like, a lot, a lot of information. For some of these cases, I also had access to investigative material, of course, uh, anonymized before I could access it. So there was a lot of um, information on both the, um, let's say, online and the offline uh, aspects of this activity. So, Again, uh, we don't have time for the examples, uh, but what was very important for me from, as a criminologist was to see that uh, the emergence uh, in the online criminal markets of new criminal actors that were not act active in the markets before, and uh, a real reconfiguration of relations among suppliers, uh, intermediaries, uh, and buyers. So again, a lot of new opportunities for crime, but once we identify these opportunities uh, in very specific way, this gives us a lot of opportunities also to tackle this criminal activity. So this is the idea behind again, script analysis. Uh, just very quickly, this was a kind of a first follow-up that I did to that research. So, um, uh, with the script analysis, I focused uh, a lot on the criminal activity. I was able to uh, see some uh, changes, interesting changes uh, in criminal groups uh, that were involved in, this, uh, in these activities. Um, but I was still puzzled a little bit uh, because in my readings, I was reading uh, a lot about uh, uh, organized crime moving online and cyber organized crime behind this type of, uh, of activities. But again, coming from organized crime research, I couldn't really meet my working definition of what I was observing. So I did some further in-depth analysis on the groups that uh, I was able, again, to observe with uh, this uh, um, let's say, uh, in-depth level of, uh, of qualitative data. And uh, what is very interesting to observe is here is uh, the, how very loose networks that, again, as organized crime researcher will not identify as organized crime, but how they can be as or even more efficient of traditional organized group uh, because of the exploitation of internet uh, opportunities. Uh, with all the policing implications. Uh, so uh, basically, these new criminal opportunities, yes, give me, uh, they give us the new vulnerabilities, but also new dynamics, new possibilities uh, for social and institutional control. The problem, again, is that traditional policing uh, cannot be as effective as it could be because, of course, of the vastness, at least uh, just for monitoring purposes, uh, or the vastness of the environment that it has to, uh, uh, to monitor. Um, and so the importance of looking uh, a little and thinking a little bit outside of, of the box or of like traditional uh, like policing um, uh, ways uh, uh, in order to be uh, more effective in uh, uh, tackling wildlife crimes in cyberspace. So just to conclude what I'm doing uh, now, so as I said before, my previous research was a very in-depth qualitative analysis on a limited number of cases. Uh, now I'm leading FloraGuard. FloraGuard is a bigger ECRC-funded project where I'm focusing only on, uh, on plants uh, and on the uh, online um, uh, trafficking of, uh, of endangered plants. It's a criminology and policing-led project with uh, uh, a lot of input of computer science and conservation <coughs> science. So in this project, we are uh, um, trying, but from a criminology point of view, I'm mostly uh, looking at what are the uh, needs of law enforcement, uh, what are the best practices in this moment, uh, and the computer science led part of the project uh, is uh, trying to build one of these uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, automatic softwares that were mentioned before by my uh, colleagues, uh, and what we are trying to do here is to use a lot of interdisciplinarity in uh, like building our, uh, our tools. So there, are, there is criminology, computer science, and conservation science uh, involved trying to do something with a practical um, outcome. And uh, yeah, I think I've already run out of time, so. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, I'm Caroline Cox, I'm from the University of Portsmouth, I'm a lawyer, please don't hold that against me. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the legal aspect of all of this and how it affects us in the UK because up till now that's what most of my research has, has been focused on, um, the illegal wildlife trade online in the UK. When I first met Dave, actually we were at a meeting with a group of, a um, very mixed group actually, Dave, wasn't it? Law enforcement uh, there, uh, there, and, um, and uh, antiques dealers. And 
Dave started talking about the online trade, whereas I'd been focused previously on sort of trade in auction houses and, uh, and car boot sales and this sort of thing. And he started talking to me about the online trade. And I said, oh my gosh, Dave, does this mean I've got to go on the dark web? And he said, oh, bless you, Caroline. No, let's just have a little look on eBay, sweetie. And <laughs> it opened a whole new world to me that I had no idea existed. So thank you, Mr. <laughs> so the law, um, everybody in this room I, I, I know will know this, but the law in the UK is, is very clear. It's, it's illegal to, to sell ivory if that ivory has, has come from an elephant that died after 1947. It's really simple. So it's illegal to sell it, it's illegal to buy it, it's illegal to advertise it for sale. You know, Cotes is, is very clear on that. However, there is this thing called the antiques derogation that currently exists in our law, and that's very much what the new ivory bill is, is, is there to deal with, because the antiques derogation says that you can sell a piece of worked ivory provided it came from an elephant that died before 1947 and that piece of ivory was worked before 1947. So you can imagine already be thinking, oh my goodness, number one, how do I know, looking at it, that the elephant died before 1947? And number two, how do I know that the thing was carved into what it is now before 1947? So horrendous um, issues, as you can imagine, for my friend Alan down the bottom. <laughs> so um, along comes the 2018 Ivory Bill, and the bill ends the, the so-called antiques derogation, and instead it introduces new exempt categories. And these are they. There's a new de minimis rule, which, if it goes through as it's proposed, will enable ivory that's pre-47 to be sold if there's less than 10% of the, the volume of the item being ivory. Musical instruments are going to be exempt, provided um, they're before 1975. Portrait miniatures, these are the tiny little paintings that are painted on a slither of ivory. They're it, 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 they came to an end by the mid-19th century, so they are, by their very nature, old. nobody's using those anymore. Uh, and historic and cultural items, which is perhaps um, the, the, the major category that's causing people concern as to what it is that's going to be a, a historical or culturally important item. Um, and finally, trade between museums, if the bill goes through as it's suggested, that's going to continue to be allowed. So... That's all very simple, isn't it? Because we're really clamping down, aren't we? Awesome. Simple. Here is the problem. Um, we talk about trade between antiques dealers, trade if you go and buy something at an auction house. It's very there, isn't it? It's very obvious. You, you, you're right there. You're looking, you're looking the, 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 um, the guy in the eye. You're, you're holding the piece in your hand. But when you're dealing with an online trade, that is not what's happening. Not only are you working across jurisdictions, different rules, different laws, different regulations, but you can't see what it is you're holding. It's hard enough to tell whether this piece you're going to buy came from an elephant that died before 1947 if you've got it in your hand. Imagine how much harder it is to tell if you're looking at a picture online. Which is why eBay introduced their ban on ivory at the end of 2008. So as of the 1st of January 2009, eBay simply said, you know what, we can't be doing with all of this cross-jurisdictional stuff. We don't know whether what's going on our site is legal or not. We want to, you know, buy in to, to stopping the illegal wildlife trade. So do you know what, we're banning ivory. Easy. It's simple as that. So that would have solved the problem. If only it weren't for the old adage, when is an elephant not an elephant? The answer is, if you're selling something on eBay, when it's a cow. Because Dave will tell you, because he's done a lot of work on this, if you want to sell a piece of ivory on eBay, you don't call it ivory. You call it bovine bone, or you call it cow bone. Or I heard this morning at another session that the latest thing is you call it um, uh, white gold. That's the new Chinese one, white gold. So online sellers are using all sorts of euphemisms to sell ivory. We know, because we've, I've done research on it myself, several people on this panel have done research on this too, mm -hmm. that if you go on to any of the big online platforms, eBay, Gumtree, etc., today you will see ivory for sale. 
Now, some of that ivory may actually be legal to sell in the UK because it may be pre-1947 worked ivory. Whether or not it's legal to sell in the UK is one thing. It is against eBay's own selling regulations to sell it per se because eBay have a blanket ban on the sale of ivory. So the question really for me is how do these big uh, online platforms regulate themselves? How do you regulate your own rules when you're as big as eBay? When you're active in 190 countries? When you've got 90 million users? When you've got a billion plus active adverts every day? How do you effectively regulate the online trade? So in comes the Ivory Bill 2018. This is going to put the UK, as our government says, right at the forefront of the fight against the illegal ivory trade. The illegal wildlife trade is coming later, but for this, for the illegal uh, um, ivory trade. The question is, will it stop online trading? The problem for me is the same issues are still there. There's still the use of pseudonyms. There's still this lack of enforcement. There's still the poor prosecution rates. And until those things change, no, our new ivory bill, shiny and awesome as it is, is not going to stop the online trade of ivory. I really loved this quotation from um, Sparks from the Philosopher's Stone. You may legislate against human nature, but human nature will always get the best of legislation. And I'm afraid that is the evidence that we're seeing. One door shuts, the next door opens. So you start looking for bovine bones, so they start using the next euphemism. And that's what we're up against. I'm sorry to say. And so, for me, it's going to be about helping enforcement and helping the likes of Alan, sorry Alan, ensure that people who are using eBay, Gumtree, etc., are brought to justice. And with that, I hand you over to the National Wildlife Crime Unit. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, well, I work for the UK National Wildlife Crime Unit, as you've heard, um, and basically I'm 45 years in the, in the job of being a police officer, um, either police officer or a retired police officer doing police work. I know how to do that, and, and I have done that for a long time, and, and so I'm reasonably good at it. What I don't know is the guy, what these guys know, and, and I can use, when somebody's got something... Um, with the evidence to take to court, I can actually use that and put it in the right place. So what we need is the tools that is given to us by everybody else. So, um, in the UK, where we are at the moment, um, we do a lot of work with, uh, and we're quoting Ivory, we've done a, quite a lot of work recently in relation to um, border force identifying people that are going to, uh, to send things off through the, uh, the ports. Um, we then get the, uh, get the evidence about that and use the intelligence that that pulls together to identify from that um, people that are consolidating within the UK and the buyers outside of the UK um, and where they're going from. Largely what we're doing is a very unsophisticated search of, of the internet. And, and, and what we get generally is the people that are operating at a reasonable level. We try to get our people that are, that are operating in multitudes of, of ivory, and, you know, people that are selling hundreds of items. Um, where we want to be is getting the people that are organising this in, at, the, at the next level. Um, they are generally operating through the internet, not, not necessarily in the traditional way of cybercrime, but through operating, talking to each other, all the methods that Dave has talked about um, with, with his, um, his talk there. And, and at the bottom line, one thing that we've heard quite a lot of today is the connections with organised crime. Now, one thing about organised criminals is that they operate with commodities. They don't necessarily think, I'm going to deal with just ivory. They may be ivory today, people trafficking tomorrow, and whatever it happens to be, drugs or guns, the next. And, and so we've actually got to focus on identifying 
the organised criminality um, and, and, and how, to, how to deal with those. Um, so how are we going to do it? Well, at the moment there are 12 of us in our unit and we've, it's quite a hard job actually pulling it together. Fortunately, um, the, um, the recent CITES um, intercessional working group has identified to uh, the CITES um, secretariat that it, it needs, every country needs to have a specific um, cyber wildlife um, capacity. So whatever the capacity that is, obviously the countries um, in involved will need to decide. What we need is more people in the units, and hopefully this will give us the, the leverage to push government into, into telling them they need to do that. Um, we've got to look at how to deal with wildlife crime as an organised crime and go to the people that are like the National Crime Agency that are already dealing with uh, organised crime. Um, one thing about that, unfortunately, it does go under the radar. And so all the tools that they're using to deal with wildlife, so their, their traditional crime, they will say, well, yes, OK, we're dealing with people trafficking, we're dealing with drugs, we're dealing with terrorism, and so on and so forth. And wildlife crime doesn't even hit that radar. And that's why we've got to come to people that know what they're doing. And, and the people that are actually in the business, whether it's the NGOs, whether it's the, the uh, civil society, as we've heard with the... Uh, um, the, the transport people or, or whether it's the, the academics that know how to deal with these things. We don't need to learn all of those things. There's people doing well at them already. And, and so actually our job is to, to use all those things to deal with uh, the international organised crime that it is. I think that's probably me. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Is, this, is this on? Okay. Perfect. So we have about uh, 20 min 15 minutes. Um, telling time was never my strong suit, uh, as you can tell from me doing my job um, throughout the panel. Um, but the rest of the time is for discussion with the panelists. And so um, I believe that there's some microphones uh, in the back. Um, we'll just ask that everybody that does ask a question actually uses the microphone because while we may be able to hear you, there's actually a sizable audience online watching this, stream, this event streaming um, and they would also like to be able to hear your questions. So um, we'll take questions from the audience and if you don't ask any questions, then I definitely will. So <clears throat> we'll come down here. <clears throat> Um, thank you. My name is Lorraine Elliott. I'm from the Australian National University. Um, I wonder if, if you can share any of your experiences about what we might call um, the sort of the adjacent or the facilitating use of um, online as well. So, for example, um, I've spoken to people who talk about the fact that there's actually an online black market in fraudulent CITES documentation, um, just as one example. So, I, I, so it seems to me we're not talking just about using the internet to put buyers and sellers um, in touch with each other, there is actually a whole range of other dimensions of, of cybercrime that relates to illegal wildlife trade as well. So I'd be interested perhaps in, in your own knowledge uh, uh, about that, if you've come across that in your work as well. I can, uh, okay. so, uh, I can start uh, trying to answer to this one maybe. So um, I fully uh, agree. I think that there is, there is a high degree of specialization. That's why I think that uh, probably we should really break down the old concept of like internet facilitated, like wildlife well, traffic and you know, things like that, because uh, there is like such a plethora and a variety of different uh, uh, like uh, uh, actors. Uh, and I was trying to say before criminal opportunities. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, the last presentation was focusing on Ivory, where Ivory has uh, sophisticated organized crime, if you want gangs uh, like on the back, but if I see the majority of cases that uh, was, I was observing that were like not on Ivory, for instance, uh, the type of groups are completely different, are very loose, they are not specialized enough to think about forgeries just because they don't have uh, the resources to do that. And actually, via the internet, they can like easy, easily access that expertise. Uh, so that's, uh, why I was telling before, I mentioned before, the fact of new criminal actors uh, that uh, were absolutely not criminal before because they didn't have the possibility to easily enter the market, that because of online possibilities, of, of, of online criminal opportunities, they can uh, have access to all this uh, variety of resources, uh, basically, which doesn't, 
They might, for instance, uh, use different, if you want, like suppliers, for instance, for in terms of forgeries, in terms of like, documentation, etc. So the, this person might not become part of the groups, uh, but they are there selling their expertise online, uh, as you will just like, I don't know, look for an expert on, I don't know, like translation or something online. That's a really interesting question. My uh, background has been looking um, primarily at the, at the antiques trade and how antique ivory or uh, ivory items masquerading as antique ivory has been sold online. But what I've noticed, uh, in addition to uh, um, sellers selling ivory items, are, are also items that I'd call uh, toxic cultural goods, so things like Nazi memorabilia, for instance. Uh, and it's quite often similar groups of people who are dealing in, in those sorts of things too. So I think actually, certainly with um, the, the group of sellers that, that I've personally been looking at, um, they're not simply interested in ivory. They're interested in a variety of um, illegal or regulated goods. Yes, um, I think one of the things we, we need to do, and I, you know, it's one of the things that I've kind of... Uh, one of the things that I, I've kind of fallen in the trap of, of not doing as, as of yet is often with uh, online wildlife trade, we just count things. And, we, and it's just a counting exercise and estimating how many they are and how many people are involved and how many items and so on. And I think we need to go beyond that because there, there's also a lot of discussion going on and it, the internet has been used to discuss how to ship things, how to, um, uh, how to use products, uh, all the sorts of discussions are around it, so whether or not it's um, traditional Asian medicines and you know effectiveness and, and so on, the, there's a lot of interest in that area, and I think we need to start looking at actually what, how people are discussing it, not just how they're actually selling it. Yeah, I, I'd just like to follow on from that. There's, there's sort of three things that popped into my mind when you, <laughs> when you asked your question. The, the first of them is, is the obvious one of, of you know, online information services providing uh, an extra set of information. So I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the signs that now go up saying, please don't take a photo of this rare species because it's probably a geo, your image is probably geotagged. So you've got, you've got that element of the service and you will get people that collate that information specifically. Um, the second one sort of comes more from my experience of studying the, the, the drug and hacking tool marketplaces online, particularly in the dark web. And um, one of the things that, that struck me was this idea that of wildlife crime as an organized crime. It's also these criminal enterprises are businesses in an almost traditional sense. And when you go onto a, online to buy a hacking tool, you don't just buy a piece of software, you buy a tech support contract where you have somebody that you phone up and you say, I'm trying to break into the Pentagon and it's not working. And they say, well, <laughs> click here and click here and click here. Yeah. And so, you know, you're going to get this level of, you know, and people who will recommend the best drug to buy and things like this. Um, and then the, the, the final one is very linked to what Dave was just saying, which is about sort of influence and desirability. So people who aren't necessarily sort of using the, the internet to, to, to buy or sell specifically, but they may well be driving the desire amongst consumers for a particular um, product. And I think that that's harder to police, harder to regulate, but is probably in many ways much more sort of pervasive and, diff and, and, and effective in many cases. So there's lots of things there. Just, just one final uh, thing. I think that um, Caroline's quote on the um, on the, her last slide about um, the the um, I forget what it said now, yeah. but it was basically that the laws always a, a, an ass. Basically, um, <laughs> the the the, the exactly. thing the, the point is that, that the, the criminals that are out there are not doing it because they like the animals. They're doing it because they want money, mm -hmm. and if they find a means of getting money, more money by selling the permits than they do by the selling the animals, they'll go to permits mm -hmm. and, and they'll operate to move around for the commodity that gets them the most money. All the way back, sorry, all the way back. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sandesh Nupani. I'm from uh, Trivan University, Nepal. Uh, my question is about uh, international laws regarding uh, online trade. Uh, so in one of my researches, uh, uh, I encountered a problem that uh, a species that uh, was uh, legally uh, sold in India via online uh, 
trade was illegal in Nepal. So that problem was uh, solved by quarantine in our country. Uh, is there any other sorts of pro solutions uh, to that problem? But that, that is, sorry, am I okay to jump? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, th that, that is the million dollar issue, isn't it? The problem is you're dealing with multiple jurisdictions. Um, and even though those jurisdictions may all be members of CITES, that doesn't necessarily mean they have the same amount of domestic legislation in place. Australia's a, Australia's a really good example of that right, right now, isn't it? Because you've got your, your, ivory, um, your ivory inquiry going on right now. Um, so th that, that's the big problem. So that's why eBay tried to do something about it way back in 2009 with their, well, okay, we understand that it might be legal to sell it here and illegal to sell it there, so let's just ban the sale of it on our site. Of course, th the problem is it hasn't worked because it, I think it's almost impossible, really, for an, for an organization the size of eBay to monitor what is going through the site. There are billions, billions and billions of listings a week on that site. It's nigh on impossible without some serious investment in some really good tech. Dave. <laughs> um, but no, you, you raise the million dollar problem that different jurisdictions and cross-jurisdictional trade is, is a major issue. And I think one of, the, um, one of the main issues is that when we're focusing on online wildlife trade, Often we think it's enough just to identify that it's tigers or it's ivory. It's a, you know, my background is uh, as a uh, taxonomist, and so I just see it as a tax, you know, classification problem. Is it uh, a species that is uh, threatened, and uh, is it is there a law that it is breaking? And it can be for animal health, human health, trading standards, plant health, what, what, whatever it is. But there are a variety of different laws, and we need to, when we're looking at items online, it's not just a case of identifying that it's elephant ivory or it's uh, orchid, it is why it is illegal. And I think that's one of the things that we're not doing at the moment, is we're identifying the species but not identifying the illegality. Um, one, one example that fits in well with what you've asked, actually, is we've heard this, uh, this afternoon um, that China has banned items that are uh, illegal or illegal wildlife on, on the internet, basically. The, but that's for their illegal wildlife. But some of those species are protected internationally, so they still allow things like musk or saiga antelope to be traded because they've come from what their approved sources say are legal. And so once they move them out of the, um, out of the borders of China, they become illegal. And, and you have raised a quite an important dilemma, and, and, and hopefully one of the tools we've heard about in one of the other workshops today, where we're able to find out about um, different laws in different countries. Um, I, I think that, that that sort of thing will be helpful, but um, CITES is there for that purpose, and, and it's the best tool that we have at the moment. Right in the middle, actually. And this will probably, well, unless the panelist breaks from the recent tradition <laughs> and uh, has a short answer, this will probably be our last, um, our last question. Maybe one more. Thanks. Um, yeah, Rowan Martin from the World Parrot Trust. Um, and I think, obviously, automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning and things has a lot of potential to uh, help identify illegal trade online. Um, but I was wondering what the panel thinks about um, how to integrate sort of expert opinion or uh, sort of maybe taxonomic specialists into some of this uh, sort of trawling the web for illegal trade. Um, I'm thinking particularly about things like identifying if something's captive bred versus wild caught based on its behavior and things like that that law enforcement people wouldn't normally be expected to be able to, to grasp. That's actually how I got into working on online wildlife trade. I was a taxonomist at uh, Kew Gardens working on orchids, and I got asked to write a report on uh, online orchid trade. Uh, you know, before that, I'd worked in terms of orchids and CITES permits and so on, but that's how I actually got into it, was actually being a taxonomist and being asked to go and identify orchids online and identify whether or not they were potentially well collected. So it, it does happen, yeah. 
And, and we, sorry, um, we, we do, um, as a matter of course, pull in experts to, to identify whether something is a species, whether it's not a species, whether it's um, been captive bred or, or, or otherwise and so on. Um, but the, the other angle of that, of course, is that we need people as experts, um, we use the JNCC in, in the UK to provide um, impact statements when it comes to court, to, so actually the court understands why this thing needs protection as well. So. Can, can I just add, sort of, speaking as a computer scientist, th this is where we run into endless problems with AI and machine learning, which is they are tools in the toolkit. They are not the solution to the problem. Um, so, and, and the trouble comes when we start trying to fit our problems to the tools that we have. So if we start trying to answer our problems by, by limiting those, them to those that AI can solve, we start limiting the, problem, the solutions that we can come up with. So I think there's always going to be a role for human contextual information in this, which can be supported by the AI tools. But I think that the trouble is that we move more and more into a world where we're trying to say, well, this can just be solved if only we were to build a better AI system, and that's not always, the, in fact, that's very rarely the, the whole answer. If I can add quickly on this, I think that, for instance, in uh, the Florigal project that I mentioned before, the big like, challenge that we're having now is uh, trying to integrate, because we have the computer scientists taking care of the, let's say, uh, AI tool, and uh, to uh, bring in uh, on, uh, uh, let's say, samples of the data that are gathering, uh, computer um, criminologists and uh, conservation science expertise, try to identify and and to, let's say, to give an input back to the computer scientists about proxy indicator that can suggest a certain degree of illegality once we have identified the, uh, let's say, the plan that is like likely to be illegal, but we cannot like prove illegality through the AI system. So I think that uh, there is the effort of doing that. Uh, we are like trying to do that. Uh, then uh, let's see at the end of the project to what extent we've been successful in, uh, in solving this, but it's definitely a problem. Uh, we are aware of that. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I don't think you can ever replace the human expert. Um, can I just tell you one really quick story? I was, when I was doing some research for the elephant in the sale room, I met a very well-known net ski dealer who held a piece of net ski in his hand. You know, the little net skis, they can be carved out of ivory, they can be carved out of many different things, tiny little things. You'd have had them on your toggle belt in ancient Japan. And he looked at this little tiny thing and he said, oh yes, it was carved by so-and-so and he was in such and such a province. It was a Tuesday, it was raining. The, this, the, the knowledge that this person had was extraordinary and there's no AI on the planet that's going to be able to replicate Max Rutherford. Well, let's see. We're a minute over. Um, we can take one more question. Uh, and Hi, uh, I listened to all your expert opinions with fascination and awe, so thank you for the presentation. Um, I work for a cybersecurity company, and um, I'm a crime analyst. My boss was um, a policeman in the Australian police. We've got... Um, uh, systems engineers, we've got a crawler, um, which is um, text, and um, we're just getting into image crawling, and we'd like to offer some support pro bono. So um, please come and see me. Um, at, like, <laughs> as Thanks I say, we're, we're, a, we're a technical company, but um, we do have a team of people because we do second level checks. So um, I completely agree, it's, we, we won't ever be out of a job. Um, so yeah. if if... Rather than ask a question, I was really keen just to sort of put my hand up and say, if we can help in any way um, or talk about your needs and what we can provide, please come and see me. So. Awesome. I knew I made the right choice by taking one more question. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say thank you, but before everybody gets up, I really wanted to say thank you to the panelists. And while I hate picking out one individual to say an extra thanks to, we're really all here. And a lot of this work is getting moved forward in the community really because of Dave. Um, it was... Dave's idea to bring us all together. He proposed this session. He's been a constant advocate in the community to be thinking about this and to be thinking about it in the full complexity that the issue presents itself in. And so I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to Dave for putting this together and thank you to everybody for working on this issue. Appreciate it.